Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Son of a Blitch podcast. I'm your host, George Blitch, and I am here with a special treat. I had a wonderful conversation with Lance Lewis. Uh, you guys might know him by his company, Tagged Out Kitchen. Uh, he is a wild game chef and just a phenomenal one at that. Um, he basically kind of talks about his idea of taking things from field to table. Uh, he has a lot of clients that he's worked with. They're all, you know, they'll have a hunt and he'll go out there and maybe someone takes an animal and he's like talking about, okay, once it hits the ground, what do you do? And then how are you butchering it? How are you preparing this meat? What are you saving these for? And then giving the recipes and kind of just walking you through A to Z. Um, he works with a lot of different organizations, uh, talks about that. Uh, some of the different people he goes out and does these demonstrations with, with tagged out kitchen. And he's had some amazing wild game dinners that he's prepared. Some of my friends have gone to, uh, wasn't able to make the last one there in Denver, but hopefully the next one, Meg and I will make it out to, but you know, I got to see some of the recipes that he had on there and just, oh man, some phenomenal dishes. Um, really looking forward to, uh, going and learning more about that in person someday. And I highly suggest you guys look into that at taggedoutkitchen.com. Uh, you know, we we covered all sorts of bases. He gave us a bunch of recipes for different types of wild game. Obviously, being in hunting season right now, we talk a lot about that. And uh, he also talked about the buffalo, the bison, that he ended up butchering recently. It was over 2,000 pounds. And he talked about, you know, what do you do? How do you get an animal like that into an area that you can go ahead and butcher? And, man, it was a, an incredible conversation with that. We talk about all sorts of fun stuff. You know, Lance is just a really great guy, great energy, and is just has so much knowledge to share about cooking, uh, about wild game. And I just think you guys are really going to enjoy this. I had a wonderful conversation. So without further ado, here is the podcast with Lance Lewis with Tagged Out Kitchen. Enjoy. Hey, Lance, how you doing today, man? Doing great, George. How are you? Fantastic, man. I'm excited to chat about all the different things you got going on. And, you know, I figured best way to start is always at the beginning. Will you please walk me through uh, your introduction to the outdoor world, maybe some of your mentors and who kind of got you into your hunting and and, your, and then cooking, uh, you know, lifestyle and just kind of maybe give me the very beginning and we'll go from there. Yeah. So I guess the very beginning would be uh, growing up in South Louisiana, we we were a hunting family. My my dad was a member of a hunting camp. We had really long hunting seasons for big games. So um, from a very early age, I think uh, I got my first deer when I was like nine or 10. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it came from my dad putting me on a two by four up in a tree with a 20 gauge shotgun. And, <laughs> and it was the 80s. We let it roll. Yeah, you know? yeah, I know exactly and, what you're talking about. Yeah, <laughs> and then, uh, and then you know, I I did that up until the time I left for the military. Uh, during my time in the military, I wasn't really able to hunt. Uh, and once I got out of the military, I started working, got a job out here in Colorado, and moved out here 23 years ago. And and uh, of course, once I moved to Colorado, I had to pick up hunting again. Yes. And, um, and I've been, um, Western hunting now for 20 some odd years and I try to get out and hunt anywhere else I can get out and hunt in in the process. So, you know, I, I've really, I, I've, you know, uh, that Western hunting lifestyle really kind of re, re lit a spark and I really just, you know, it, it, it brings back fond memories of being a kid and also uh new adventures as an adult so so when was that a big pivotal change going from louisiana to you know western big game and run around the mountains and stuff for you is that something that was easy for you to kind of acclimate to that new environment or was just like was there some challenges involved with that oh no it, it was huge challenges uh first and foremost was just learning to shoot out west mm -hmm. i mean to most Eastern hunters, if you say anything over a hundred yards, it's like, whew, that's far. That's long distance. <laughs> 200 yeah. yards. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, you, you get out West and even the plains, the plains are massive. You know, um, if, if you can't shoot 300 yards, you can't shoot a yard basically. If yeah. you're 
out on the plains. Uh, sure. Same, you know, same with the mountains. I mean, you you need to be comfortable with taking those longer cross canyon shots because you've already hiked two days to get to where you're hunting. And and if your comfort zone's 200 yards and the herd is 300 yards, you know, and there's no way to close that gap, you know. So so that definitely was a big change. That and also um, equipment-wise was a big change. I mean, growing up uh, stand hunting, mm-hmm. you know, if you packed the wrong gear, you had a cold afternoon in the West. If you packed the wrong gear, you could die. So you know, true. I mean, uh, or if you get wet, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, so definitely uh, understanding the gear, understanding the terrain, um, being in shape. Yep. You know, um, you a lot goes in. A lot goes into Western hunting. So yeah, yeah. No, it's a lot to train for. I, I know friends of mine who like they'll they'll be oh June they'll tag. And like six months before their training, and they got that one guy who's like, I don't need to train. And it's like, get the feeling you're gonna spend a lot of time at camp, my friend. <laughs> like, yeah, you gotta be that's prepared. The, that's that's the cook. Yeah, that's the cook. There you go. <laughs> well, but, speaking uh, of cooking, I'd love to kind of hear about, you know, when you kind of started cooking wild game yourself. Was that something that was very common for you when you were growing up in Louisiana. I mean, I know the culture of Louisiana and like cooking and, you know, wild game go hand in hand. And so I figured that that's something that's, you know, you were probably indoctrinated into at a young age. When did you kind of take that and start running with it yourself? Um, Really all of that started once I was at an adult on my own and mm-hmm. was hunting. Yep. Um, I would come home after a successful hunt and have to figure out what to do with stuff. But with that said, I also had wild game interchangeable with domestic proteins my entire life. So it wasn't that much of a stretch, Yeah, which, you know, not to get too far ahead of myself, but I get a lot of those kind of questions along the way about like, what do you do with this protein or what do you do with that protein? And come to find out. People, most people, it seems, grew up with that one family recipe for deer <laughs> that usually involved cook it, cook it till there's no jiggle in it, right. and and uh, eat it. the the terrible the the terrible liver taste is part of the deer, <laughs> right? Or that gamey flavor, you know, that's just part of the deer. That's you know, so but not to, again, not to get too far ahead. But but no, I, I I always grew up with an understanding that of how game was interchangeable with domestic proteins, and you know, especially growing up down south, there wasn't much we were afraid to try to cook and eat, right? You know, <laughs> so so we're, as a culture, we're pretty adventurous with uh, with our food. No, I, being from Texas, I understand. And at Louisiana, all my friends, same kind of thing. It's like, have you ever tried this? It's like, it's easier to make the list of what you haven't tried, right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, you know, there there's a couple of things that I've had. I'm, I'm not a fan. I don't know if I could necessarily just dive in wholeheartedly. I've yet to have that one magic dish, dish to change my mind. But, hey, I'll try it. Yeah, yeah, no. I, yeah. We, I remember the wild game uh, cookoffs that they used to do here in uh, Fort Bend County, outside of Houston. And you go around, and there's just every single thing imaginable. And you know, just as a kid, that guy was just you just tried it, and you're like, "What are you eating? What's a Rocky Mountain oyster?" No, don't worry about it. You just you just try it out. You know, <laughs> people yeah. are like trying to give it out, and I'm like my dad be like, "You don't want to try that one." I'm like, "Okay, cool." <laughs> so, yeah. As a kid, I'm like, but I remember they had like raccoon and armadillo, just things that like you would never normally think of i tell my friends up in new england about those things like you ate what (laughs) yeah yeah you tried it it's like roadkill cafe right yeah i mean look i one of one of my nuggets of wisdom i like to give out is if it has a hoof you can cook it medium if it has a foot cook it well you know (laughs) there you go there's a t-shirt there somewhere i feel like there's (laughs) probably (laughs) (laughs) so let's talk about like your your decision and your kind of background and like moving into uh you know really being in that professional world as being a chef and 
your training, you know, traditionally, like what is it that your culinary experience, how is it that you decided to kind of, you know, eventually do tagged out kitchen, but, you know, talk me about how we got to that point there and, you know, your journey in that world. Yeah. So, um, prior to my culinary life, I, I worked in industrial controls and installed, uh, high-end uh, electromechanical systems throughout airports throughout the country and stuff like that. And uh, decided to change things up and was doing a lot of cooking and smoking at home. And everybody was like, oh, this is great. You should open a place. Realizing every failed restaurant started with, you should open a place. I, I, re- I understood that there was more to the craft that I needed to know beyond I could be a good home home cook. Mm-hmm. So I sought out a local culinary school. Um, I went through their professional program upon graduation. I was asked to stay on as a chef instructor. So for me, that that was great, right? Like I was a little bit older. I was not going to dive into the uh, kitchen world or the professional kitchen world as we know it. You know, that's that's a young man's game or a young person's game, you know. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, So I was happy to stay on as a chef instructor there. And, you know, it kind of helped me as a chef think, think differently, right? Like I was responsible for writing courses and writing the menus for the courses as well as the recipes. And, and I had to think of them as if I had to think of them as the student in putting this stuff together. So it really kind of changed my mind on how do I simplify things? How do, how do I, make make it not as intimidating to get behind the stove and be creative right right so so i mean that helped me out quite a bit um also um and kind of here's where tagged out kitchen kind of comes into play part of what i did was i taught um recreational butchery classes like whole hog butchery and those sorts of things and i quickly realized that a lot of the people that were taking these classes we're hunters, you know, um, because where else do you learn how to butcher? Sure. You know, and unless you, unless you have that uncle that took you under his wing or whatever, yep, right. Yep. Like there, there's no, there, sure. There's no shortage of YouTube and internet resources out there, but how do you get a hands on to it? You know? So, so in talking with, and talking with the hunters that were taking these classes, I understood where they were coming from as a hunter and maybe where I could help as a chef. Yeah. So at that point I started to kind of look into as an industry, what's going on with this, right? Like the outdoors industry is huge. It's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, but very little of it is focused on hunter education. Yeah. It's all about selling hunts and selling gear, but not, but when you look at the piece of the pie that actually involves training, there's nothing there really. So, I mean, it's a pretty wide open field in that regard, which, you know, I, you know, primary focus of a tagged out kitchen event obviously is the food, but, you know, I also like sprinkling in, all the other aspects as well to kind of create one cohesive event. Well, let's, let's jump into that too. Cause I, I feel like we're, we're talking about it, but I want, you know, listeners to really be able to understand, um, you know, let's lay out exactly what tagged out kitchen is your events kind of give, you know, not just the broad strokes, but kind of let's, let's put some color into that and let's talk about that so that people can understand. And I think then we can kind of jump into some other, you know, conversations and questions about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So first and foremost, Tagged Out Kitchen is an outdoor experience company, right? Um, so with that, what what I do is either I could do something as simple as a personal, as a private dinner with chef instruction and create more of a chef table experience, or I could broaden that out even to a full hunting experience where we undergo basic more. Uh, under or tackle basic marksmanship, uh, shot placement, then follow that up with post-harvest care, butchery around the sausage, and then 
conclude that with the chef's table experience where as a guest, you're cooking alongside me. I'm teaching a culinary class for with you. Yeah. And you really get that full hands-on 360 approach to it. Sure. No, that, that's that's it, that's amazing. I mean, it for people who are starting at zero and that now can have somebody like you be able to walk them through every single step of the way. You know, that's something that wasn't, you know, common for the longest time. And I know it's still not common. There are some people and, you know, you and I have talked about some yep. chefs that we know who who do this as well, you know, all around the, the country. But it's still few and far between. And that accessibility um, and affordability used to just not be there. And, you know, your, your courses to have someone come in, it's that, you know, it's well worth every penny, but it's not every penny that they're going to have in their bank to go and have that experience. And I'm sure there's more things, Hey, you want to do a four course meal and over four different times, you want to do these different animals. Sure. They can add up and, and things like that. But, you know, what is somebody, if somebody wants to come in and, you know, maybe, Let's just pick something, for example, we're going to go ahead and you're going to do one meal, maybe consisted of a few different wild game, and somebody wants to come into one of these experiences, you know, how do they get involved in that and what kind of cost are they maybe looking at to be able to be a part of that and kind of, you know, have it kind of from maybe not from all the way from the field to the table, but, you know, it's been butchered and now here's what you do. Um, yeah, so typically how how I work my events is I get with, I, I will get with landowners, ranch owners. And really, I try to focus it around a cull hunt that they mm-hmm. offer. You know, so say, for instance, a, if you have a herd of axis, at some point, you need to cull your does. Right. You know, so I, I will try to work it around an existing cull hunt that they have. And then I add a fee per person to yeah. be there and create it. That way, it helps sell the hunt for the landowner. It helps... And also it helps bring new blood to their ranch. Sure. Right. You know, you, you get a client base that goes out and starts to associate with one, with a ranch. Well, when they are out there and happen to see this Ibex walking around and they go home and go, man, I want to go get an Ibex. They, they already know a place to call. Yep. Uh, for instance, if, if you search Ibex, Texas, you get, pages upon pages upon pages of places that are selling IVAX hunts in Texas. Sure. You know? <laughs> so, so, I mean, for the, for the landowner that, that ends up being a good thing because they're, you know, they're introducing people to their property. Right. And, and establishing that first contact relationship. Um, and also it, for, for the participant, you know, by doing it at a place with a high success rate, they aren't spending their entire time trying to trying to harvest their animal. They're harvesting their animal and then they're learning what to do with it beyond that. Sure. You know, so I I really think of it more as a culinary event that involves hunting than a hunt that involves culinary. Yeah, well said. Yeah. You know, uh and and from an industry standpoint, sometimes it's it's difficult to change people's minds on that. Right. Yeah. Because, well, you own land, you know yep. how it works. You sure. know, <laughs> so yeah. there's many a hunts you go on that you're going to be unsuccessful. But if you're there to be able to teach that next process after the hunt, it's good to have a high success rate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, that's why that's why Texas is great. Right. You whether it's whether it's hogs, whether it's a coal hunt on on a species. Uh, on a different species, you know, you have options. Sure. You, you have the ability to also kind of use these as a starter hunt. Say you did finally draw your Western elk tag in another state and you have a pre hunt that you can do before you go and do that hunt and kind of like a little warm up, a little preseason shakedown. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, Obviously, there's a million there's a million ways that you can point out the positivities of these sorts of things. Sure, sure. With these events, it it helps change perception because it shows people that hunting, when done right, is not blood sport and mayhem. It's actually a very ethical, clean way to to harvest an animal. Uh, I, I 
try to tell people a lot, like nature's cruel, you know? Yes. I have, I, as a hunter, I have one job and that is not to be as cruel as nature can be. You know, there, there's this, there's this video I, I saw recently and it says golden eagle standing on the back of an antelope, eating the back straps out of it while it's walking around. You know, nature's, nature's harsh. Yeah. yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. No, I think like nature is metal or whatever. It's on Instagram. Like there's always yeah. something coming up where I'm like, dang, like that. that's a <laughs> tough way to go out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so, you know, I, I think that I like to think that I have a small piece in that, in that puzzle of changing perceptions, changing minds making making the outdoors not as intimidating you know and really just kind of broadening the outdoors to a whole different group of people well you know i think you kind of touched on it a minute ago when you were talking about like coal you know for people who are listening who maybe this isn't part of their you know verbal lexicon and and this lifestyle there is a, you know, there's a reason why wild game biologists have jobs and there's a reason why they give you particular harvest numbers. So there's a certain amount of tags that are issued because you're trying to keep a, a, a healthy herd of whatever animal for future generations. It's never to be like, let's try to decimate the entire herd. Right. So like one thing that, that people need to understand is that, you know, I, I can't tell you a single hunter that I know who's not a conservationist who doesn't want to be able to keep this for future generations. It's something that inherently in our system, the money that's, you know, our taxes from the Pittman Robertson, Robertson Pittman, I always say it backwards. I can never figure that one out, but <laughs> you know, the, the money that the excise taxes that go to be able to have, you know, our public land stay public and, and open for everybody, state parks, national parks, uh, wildlife refuges, you know, all, all these places that are existing come from, you know, the people who are sportsmen and women out in the world. So when we're talking about these kinds of things, I just want to make sure that anybody who's listening, you know, hears these terms. It's like we're talking about something to be able to keep this way of life and the wilderness wild and to be able yeah. to make, help sustain that habitat and that environment for future generations. Just making sure that we're saying that because I, I think it's and it, it's a it's a responsibility for us to act as both. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, again, not to not to like get on a moral high horse or Mm -hmm. point anybody out or anything like that. But hunters are the only group that utilize public lands that actually pay for the right to do it. Hikers aren't charged at a trailhead. Mountain bikers aren't charged at a trailhead. Mm -hmm. You know, I I mean, but in essence, who is? It's your hunters. They yep. by purchasing their licenses, their stamps, paying to take hunter safety courses, all of yeah, that. Fishermen and women as well, right? The outdoors yeah. users, sure, sure. Yeah. So, so no, there's a there's a there's a lot of value there. Um, you know, I, I, and like the changes I've seen living in Colorado for as long as I have, and the effects that have been that have affected the outdoors industry or the outdoors here, you know, are, are, are just mind boggling. I mean, let's talk about that. Cause I, obviously I, I know a little bit on the peripheral, but like, you know, being an insider and someone who's been involved in that and now has an industry in that, let's talk about that. What are you seeing? What are you feeling about, you know, what's happening these days? What are some changes? So, um, you know, a, a big thing is, is like, um, our, our, our current governor and um, and um, our current governor's husband are huge supporters of animal rights groups. So the past three commissioners we've had for the Department of Wildlife here have all come from anti-hunting lobbying groups. You know, that that's part of the wolf reintroduction. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so, uh, so, you know, instead of allowing hunting, let's just reintroduce an apex predator and give it and give it, um, you know, um, an endangered classification. You know, <laughs> so right, right. So they're yeah. off. They're off the 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 list. That there's nothing you can do about them. You see them if they no. get to a certain number. They're. I mean, maybe they would change then, but at the moment, 
free reign. There's no hunting, right? Yeah. I, I mean, the, the official reintroduction hasn't happened yet. It's mm-hmm. happening very soon though. Okay. But, and, but realistically, it, it there are already wolves here. Right. I, I mean, there, there are, there, there already are, they've naturally migrated and, sure. uh, they, they only acknowledge, they only officially acknowledge the first wolf packs after the election. Ah, okay. But they, they've already been here, you know. There's more than yeah. enough ranchers and outdoors folks and whatnot that have that have seen them, you sure. know. Um, also, um, over the past few years, I mean, like there's of of your western states, Colorado has the highest percentage of non-resident tag availability. Where so we're ca- per the state guidelines were were supposed to be at 25 percent non-resident to resident tax okay or like your next highest state's wyoming which is like 11 or 12 montana is like three or four percent idaho utah same thing um but because of our draw process and preference point system uh, if you have a certain number of preference points, you either you either say you're using your preference points or you have to apply for a preference point first in order to not use preference points. Okay. Well, well, if you have preference points and you don't have enough to, say, maybe get into a better unit, you're going to, by default, forfeit your first draw and hope to pick up something in the second draw. By applying by applying for a preference point first. Well, the state has taken that data, and in certain units went, oh no, we don't have enough resident participation in this unit, so we just need to open it up to non-residents. And now, and now, certain units in the state are over sixty-five percent non-resident hunters. And and again, for people who don't understand, there's a huge difference in your state tag price and your non-resident state tag price so do you find that this is just a big money grab for them what does that look like and for you i i mean look i'm only speaking yeah on on this topic as the man on the street you know i'm i'm not i'm by no means am i in any capacity or in secret are in some secret club of knowledge. I just know, <laughs> no, I just know what I'm seeing as the end user man on the street. Yeah, no, I'm, that's what I'm curious about. And you know, I yes, the uh, non-resident bull tag is like seven hundred and sixty dollars versus sixty five dollars as a resident. But as a resident. I can't even put myself in that seven hundred dollar tag pool if I want it, right? <laughs> like, like I can't say, well, you know what? Let me let me try to buy a non resident tag and see if I can draw a tag that way. Right, it's right. not even an option on my table. And you know, I, I yes, I pay taxes to live in this state, and part of my taxes should entitle me to not have to pay $700 for a tag. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Or at least yeah. not go up against this, a, a staggeringly high number of non-residents you have to compete with for that, yeah. you know, as far as that. I mean, it's the equivalent of your, you live in a neighborhood, it's an HOA, you pay, you pay your HOA fees. And part of that is you get to use the community pool, but you can never use the community pool because they're always leasing it out for people that don't live in the neighborhood to have private parties. And they never invite me. Yeah. They never <laughs> invite me. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's, uh, again, this is, this is a whole rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I, whole rabbit hole discussion, but you know, uh, again, I think it kind of circles back to with what I do and with what others in the outdoor industry do with the process of recruiting and retaining and and keeping hunters engaged is to make the more people that are a part of it see that like oh wow it's wow it's really like that well that's not fair or 
you know, it makes it harder for for states that may or may not have an agenda mm -hmm. to push an agenda if you have more participants willing sure. that are that are wanting to be a part of of it, you know. So well, that's our voting power, right? Like that's something that's it's very important. You see it every year. There's something that comes up where there's some kind of legislation where, you know, people who maybe aren't aren't as focused or aren't thinking, you know, that they're going to go out there. It's like, no, it's important you go and vote on this because if you want to have this particular way of life or you don't want this thing to change, you want to be able to have this for your kids. It's like it's important to pay attention to those, uh, you know, as they come up because there's a lot of different things that come up every single year. And it's it's super important. So. You know, I'm glad we kind of dove into that for a minute because I'm, I'm I'm curious too, just always about hearing about other states and how things are run and what are the challenges thereof. You know. Yeah, yeah, and and again, you know, by by no means am I selling myself as an authority on the right. on the topic, but you know, but do, do a little research. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Un, un, understand understand where if you're looking at doing a Western hunt, um, you know. Wyoming and Montana, you might not, it might take you a lot longer to draw a tag, but trust me, it'll be a much better hunt. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you, you will actually end up in those places that aren't the sea of orange yes. that are, that are out there, <laughs> you know? Well, let, let's talk about some hunts that maybe you got coming up. What are some things that you put in a draw for this year? Are there some hunts that you're going out? I mean, uh, you know, and then maybe what are some tagged out kitchen events that are maybe happening in this fall that are kind of maybe yep. related or, or or unrelated and just kind of lay out on, on what's happening because we're on the edge of the hunting season and it's begun in a lot of areas and it's exciting time. So, you know, walk me through what you got going. Yeah. So um, right now this year, I, I'm doing a lot, doing a lot of private gigs. Um, I have, I, I have a lot of those scheduled coming up around the holidays. I'm going to try to get out and hunt as much as possible. I have uh some uh eastern plains whitetail tags this year nice. which um you know most of those are like mitigation tags uh white whitetail out if you're not familiar whitetail out west are aren't typically <laughs> aren't typically out here so and they're and they're doing a lot of harm to our resident mule deer population so i've been able to pick up uh several several whitetail tags that i can archery hunt as well as rifle hunt and um uh, I I feel like this year not only am I going to be doing doing um, a lot of a lot of hunting for whitetail, but I'll also be hopefully be doing some uh, good for mule deer population by that. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah, and then uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually doing an event out in Beaver Creek uh, for an event called Elevation. Uh, Elevation is a big um, in, invite only. Uh, country music fest that they do up in beaver creek uh tagged out kitchen has been invited back to sponsor a skeet shooting event for them so cool. we're gonna have some people out and uh, gonna have some people out doing some skeet shooting and i'm gonna be uh cooking a whole lot of barbecue for them so nice <laughs> and um and then um in december i'm also going to be working with a veterans organization putting on a field to table for a veterans event out in Oklahoma. Oh, that's great, man. You what know, group that's is that a, gonna be with it's, it's with, um, uh, the, uh, true warrior initiative. Mm -hmm. Um, my friend Ryan long, who is a uh, Oklahoma state police, former Marine, him and his wife started this, um, uh, this, this group a few years ago. And, um, uh, you know, they did it, to they did it cause they really wanted to get back to our, um, military and law enforcement community and uh it's this is the third year doing this event it's been a lot of fun every year great guys come out get to give back a little bit get to send them home with new skills and always get to meet some great people so yeah oh that sounds wonderful that sounds yeah. wonderful man so then it, it and that is that kind of the the main part i mean it sounds like you're gonna be working a lot so yeah, you know, but you'll be getting out there a little bit too. Anything else? You need hunting that you got going on besides those ones? Um, at this point, not right now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm at this point. I really am trying to keep my schedule open. Yeah. As as a uh, as events as events come up, um, I am in early 2024. I am going to get out and get a chance to do a little uh, herd mitigation for a private elk ranch. 
Oh, so, nice. So <laughs> I'll be able to I'll be able to get a little meat in the freezer and uh, and uh, hone my uh, elk butchery skills a little more. So. Well, speaking of honing your butchery skills, I mean, I already know you're a super talented man, but you just had a recent uh, test of your butchery skills. You know, I'm going to put this picture in here so people can understand the size. But recently you went and you butchered a buffalo that weighed between 2,000 and 2,500 pounds. And or bison, if someone want to call it that, we can get into that later. But this this picture here, I think it speaks a thousand words. You had quite the task ahead of you. Walk me through how this, it, you know, opportunity came up, and then talk me through the butchering, and then what's the what do you got planned here? I can only imagine how much of a process this was, and I am just dying to learn more about it. <laughs> so, um, I was, I've I've been having some talks with a local group. Out here is the uh, Fort McIntosh Grasslands Conservation Area. Mm -hmm. And they have probably the largest herd of Manitoban elk in the the country, as well as um, 50, 60 head of, of of buffalo out there. And... Basically, about 10 years ago, they took farmland out in eastern Colorado, did all the research, and reverted it back to the native grasslands and created this habitat for their for the Manitoban elk as well as as well as the uh, buffalo. So it's roughly like six square miles fenced in of just blue sky and eastern plains. And um uh, they they sell off they sell off hunts through over the year for elk and their bison herd to help fund the project and everything and um i spoke with their ranch manager about the possibility of maybe teaming up and doing some work together and as i left he called me and said that he just noticed one of their trophy bulls had an abscess or possibly a hernia and uh, if I knew anybody that wanted it, he could uh, let it go at a great price, <laughs> so, which was basically pennies on the dollar of what one of their trophy bull hunts go for. So I reached out to a contact. Of course, he was like, I've always wanted a massive buffalo hanging in my living room. And he drove out from Tampa and and. We connected, we went, we found the animal in question, um, and we harvested we you know, we harvested it and and um after it was on the ground, like I've I've done smaller buffalo over the years. Um uh, yeah. oddly enough, out in eastern Colorado, there's a lot of places you can just go and buy a buffalo relatively inexpensively and so I've had quite a quite a bit of experience with smaller ones, uh-huh. but never never one this size. This animal was probably 10, 11 years old. I mean, it's like they just don't get any bigger. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, and uh, so, yeah, with the use of some farm equipment and a couple of cranes and a front end loader, we got this thing to the skin and shed and got it out and hanging in the meat locker. And honestly, I just approached it like a, like I would a deer. Yeah. I, I, I pulled off, pulled out, pulled out the inside tenders. I quartered it out or I, I hunter quartered it out, not butcher quartered it. But I hunter quartered it out, and, and explain that real quick for people who don't know maybe the difference. What is hunter quartering it out? So a uh, hunter quarter is you remove all four legs, you pull the back straps, you get your inside tenders, carve off your rib meat, that sort of stuff. Where like a f- actual butcher quarter is, you split the animal into four pieces. You know, starting basically your hind quarter runs from just past the ribs split the spine down the middle and you have your two hind quarters and then, you know, split that again and you have your four quarters. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I, 
I really just kind of dove in like a big deer, did it all with a six inch boning knife. <laughs> and, uh, and, and just whittled away at it and pulled out, pulled out the, the cuts and everything as I know them on a, on, on a deer, you know, so, or on a deer or elk or, uh, any other, uh, for like a critter with that body shape, you know? Wow. So aside from the inevitable carpal tunnel, that probably came from such a process. <laughs> what kind of timeline did that look like for you? Was that something you guys took over a couple of different days or is that something you just kind of tackled all at once? What, what, what was um, that like? So, so we got the animal down. It was probably about six thirty seven 7 PM. Got it back skinned out by eight thirty nine 9 o'clock. They have they had a giant um, walk in freezer, so we were able to put the whole animal in the freezer and get it cooled out. Then the next morning, it basically was just one long day. Yeah, from about ten a.m. to about one thirty in the morning. By the time we had everything cut up, packaged, ground up, and packaged, and on our way. So then, so, what, what happened with that that meat? Is that something that that he took back with him? Did, I'm, I'm yeah, sure that there's so, some that went to your freezer too. Yeah, yeah, of course. Some of it, some of it came to my freezer. Um, I I took a lot of the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, I you know, uh, with an animal that old, it's you're you're not going to get a you're going to get a big ribeye, but it pro but it's not going to be succulent. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> A, a age plays a age plays a role. So, yep. but no, I took a I I took probably a hundred pounds of ground meat. Um, I think after it was all said and done, we had probably six seven hundred pounds of meat processed. Wow. Uh, on 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 the grasslands conservation area, they actually save all the bones, make make uh, huge amounts of uh, of stock. So every hunter goes home with like five gallons of stock when when they. When they go out there, I mean, it's a, it's one of the most complete operations I've seen as far as whole animal utilizations. You know, that's so, excellent. That's yeah. excellent. There's something to that too, as far as like, you know, we were just kind of talking before the podcast, the idea of like the buffalo and what that was, what that was for all the native people here, and using every bit. And so it's it's nice to see that that is something that is all of it's utilized in that fashion still, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and truthfully that, I think that's really, I, I think that's again, circling back to the food tie that, that is, that is your full circle, right? You know, your, your hunt and harvest is only half. Yeah. You know, the other half is what do you do after? Right. You know, unfortunately far too many people, put stuff in a freezer and then next September when hunting season comes around again, out with the old and in with the new, but you know, it's just, I, I firmly believe though, it's just because a lot of people don't know any better and, uh, and think that they have to do something special with it or save this, these proteins for a special occasion. They are everyday proteins. If you have them. Yeah. Uh, you know, believe me, hunting, you don't hunt for the econ- for the economic effect of getting deer, right? <laughs> like beef in the store is way cheaper than, like, I mean, if you think about it, what what dove meat must be about a thousand bucks a pound, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, so you have this stuff, use it. You, um, don't don't be afraid to even if you're just making hamburger helper. Don't be. A, Venison will work just fine in that. Yep. You know, you, yep. you have it, use it. I, it. It reminds me of like, I don't know if you ever seen the Jeff, Jeff Foxworthy skit where he's like talking to his wife about like the meat that he goes, he's like, you know, it cost me $5,000 a year for the lease. Plus we get the four wheeler. I'm not even including ammo in my new shotgun. And he's like, and he, he it in and goes, that's the most expensive meat on the planet. It's ninety eight dollars a pound for that venison because I want the best for my family. You think I yeah. like getting up in the morning? It's, it is the best <laughs> skit, but, but it like talks about like that economic portion. Like, yeah, it actually is very expensive meat. <laughs> look, look, America. America is the only place that hunting wasn't just for the royals, right? I mean, throughout 
I mean, if you look at the European, deer, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, when you look at European hunting, that that was that was the your top ten percent, you know. But I I think just out of need and sustainability, I think if you aren't familiar with it and you come from a place that hunting isn't prevalent, you you're more inclined to think it's the lower ten percent that mm-hmm. hunts. Right, right, right. You know, so, I mean, it's places that show you and courses that show you how to utilize this whole animal is you, you've you got gold in the freezer. No, you totally do. I use it for yeah. so many different things, man. I mean, just this week I've done burger. I've done ground for, you know, spaghetti. There's, it's just so many different things you can utilize. Breakfast sausage. And I, I I find that that's something that I try to utilize, especially as the new season approaches. I'm like, okay, now if I have some left over, I really got to do something with that. <laughs> yeah. So Lance, I actually wanted to talk to you. I, I know you got some bison to cook, but what are some other things that are in your freezer now? What are some meals that you have prepared soon for you know your family and your friends? Um. So I definitely have some wild hog in the freezer, um, and I actually have a wild hog bolognese that I made that I made this summer. So um, I always try to make all of my hunting camp meals real far in advance and have uh-huh. them packaged and frozen. So um, I have, I have some uh, Canada goose, I have some whitetail and some mule deer and a little bit of elk. Nice. Um, I, I always end up doing all of the, uh, all of my favorite cuts, which are, the shanks and necks first, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, I just think those cuts of meats, whenever they're slow braised and you make, make a traditional stew or a gravy, you know, it, it's, it's just so filling. It's so versatile and can, I mean, it, it could be that Sunday eat all week meal or that, make on Sunday, eat on Wednesday, freeze and pull out in February. I mean, there's just so many options with those things. Um, I, I have a few, I have a few steaks and some inside tenders that I'm saving for a special occasion. So Uh (laughs) what that is yet, I don't know, but (laughs) when you know, it'll be there. You can utilize it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, happened to catch a show today it was about being up at the arctic circle and this guy like kills a moose and i heard the most poignant line ever out of that show and he he had, this guy kills his moose and he's talking about bringing it back to the elders of the of the inuit village and he said that his uncle who i guess is the head elder always likes the stew me and he's like Stew is for we and steak is for me. And I was like, that that is genius. I <laughs> never thought of it that way, but it really sticks. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah, so I, I like cooking I I like mostly cooking with the we meats. <laughs> yes. That's no man, good point. Good point. I hadn't really thought about that, but that is that's true. And it it's I've heard someone recently talk about the same kind of thing too. It's like, whenever you have that gathering, it's like, that is something that go in there and put whatever you want in your bowl. And you, you know, it's not that, that is, a, I'm, I'm going to use that myself now too. I like that. Yeah. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I wish I could, uh, I wish I could remember the gentleman's name who sat it on that show so I could properly cite him. but. <laughs> hey, you know, we can look that up. We'll throw in the comments down below, you know? Yeah. There you yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, no, it was, yeah, it was one of those, like every now and then you hear a good comment and you're like, man, I wish I would have thought of that. Yep. <laughs> so. Yep. No, I did so many times. I'm, I'll am i be in the middle of conversations. I'm like, hold on. <laughs> I'm like texting myself or, you know, put it in my notes and stuff. I'm like, that was a really good one. I'm going to keep that one. Use that again. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but yeah, no. So getting back, uh, some some of the favorites I really like to do. I, I do a um, shank or neck braised in Guinness and in Guinness with leeks. Uh, that's really a that's really a favorite of mine. Um, I definitely like to go into like a lot of the classic Italian sauces. Uh, u- utilizing the um, 
the wild proteins, um, you know, and obviously there's no shortage of, uh, of different gumbo and jambalaya and all of my, uh, classic home comfort flavors. Yeah. I was going to ask, is that something that you're bringing a lot into that? Or do you kind of have, if someone was going to talk about maybe what your signature style is and how you could pinpoint it, is there something that you could kind of point to and say, yeah, it's kind of this, or do you feel like it's just influence from all around the world and maybe or or do you kind of have something that's honed in because i know you can take the boy out of louisiana if you can't take louisiana out of the boy you know yeah so so that, i mean actually that's a great question um you know and and truthfully it, it's one of those things like you never think about till you're asked yeah <laughs> so, yeah but if I, if i had to put a spin on it i would uh i would say i i draw from all of my life influences where i like um, I have a dish I do utilize in quail and duck, quail, duck, and and pheasant legs. Um, and it's kind of a hybrid of a classic French dish and a jambalaya. <laughs> uh, kind of how my mind worked, right? So in essence, there's a French dish. It's called coco van. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm sure, pretty common one. Well, in northern France. Because of the wine that's available, it's cocoa riesling. So they use uh, a white riesling wine. So I started experimenting with making cocoa riesling and then doing that with duck legs and pheasant legs and and uh, liked where it was going. And then one night, just need to make dinner. I had some barley. I threw that in and in essence made made it in the style of a jambalaya but using all of the french flavors and uh you know it it's a, it sounds a little funky but it was so delicious that's awesome <laughs> yeah well i mean you you it's the experimentation that you know comes up with certain different things like i was just kind of curious you like is that something like your approach when you're creating new dishes i mean it sounds like this one is a fusion of different ideas and you brought things together and you found out what worked is that something that you are experimenting a lot or are you kind of, you found what's worked by your experimentation or are you always going to try to find that next thing and that, you know, whatever else you can kind of bring in and fuse together? So I'm a firm believer. The classics are the classics for a reason. Yep. You know, um, all of your food trends at some point go from a classic to getting way out of bounds and finally make their way back to a classic. Right. So I I really try to stick with that mindset, but I try to think of coming at it from a place of a teacher. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to do this, how how can I how can I get the same result but make it less complicated to the end user, make it less intimidating, right? So like um, like if you made a, a classic beef bourguignon right? It's just, it's three pages in a cookbook. Well, I've, I, I kind of dummied it down, simplified a little bit of the, you know, a little bit of this and really condensed that by more than half now. And it's, and it's something as a home cook, you're willing to tackle. Right. Right. You know, so I think that's where my experimentation comes in is like, how do I take something from a level 10 and get it down to a solid 6.5, you know, as far as difficulty, you know. And I've had some successes. God knows I've had failures, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, but with every failure is uh, is another nugget of knowledge. So, yeah. you know, it, 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 it's um, it's definitely definitely a labor of love in that in that aspect. Sure. Well, it's, you know, I I think you have to kind of test those boundaries sometimes too, you know, and like, and just, I guess that's kind of a a generalized saying too, of like the failures is where you learn the most, you know, your successes, you don't really, you you can have your own accolades and things. Oh, that worked, but it's, you're not really learning. You're not pushing past another boundary. And sometimes you have to find that out. And like you're experimenting with a dish that, Hey, you were trying to utilize something a little bit different and you finally found out what worked. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've cooked something where I'm like, 
yeah, I'm going to try this. And it's like, I am not going to serve this to anybody. I, this was <laughs> just, this was not a winner. I'm going to chalk this up that that recipe's done, you know, or whatever I might've tried to do. And my buddy, Matthew Mitchell, and I would always joke about it. Like I go off script, he'll go buy the recipe. And I'm like, I'm going to try to add this into this. And he's just like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> he's yeah. like, that's the one I told you was good as it is. And now like there's some that I will follow to a T uh, one of Jesse Griffith's, the, the smothered chops. That's like anybody who I know who wants to try wild hog the first time. I yeah. found that that is the one for me that I know. And I'm sure there's many other ones I just haven't learned yet, but that's the one that I know I'm going to stick to this one because tried and true. If I do it the way that it says it, um, it's going to be something that most people find very palatable they really enjoy it and it's something that i know that i can be i can turn people you know i've had people big hogs are horrible you know 200 pounds yeah. or you know whatever that is it's anything bigger than that's bad and i'm like oh, that was a 250 pound boar you just ate you know it's like yeah if you do it the right way it's like you can make you know even something like that that is unpalatable you know very enjoyable so well it, well so much of cooking is i think a lot of cooking and cooking education overlooks the fact that cooking is simple science, mm -hmm. right? You, you've, up, you've applied heat and you're trying to make a chemical change or, you know, so I, I get frustrated sometimes when I, like when I write my recipes, I really try to write them of, do this for five minutes or your best judgment, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Or add a, add like, uh, as far as like salt and pepper, I always just do salt and pepper to taste, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I, because my, my tolerance for salt and pepper and your tolerance for salt and pepper may be two totally different things. So I, I try to, I try to approach it more from the science of it as opposed to, to the me the me me mechanical robotic side, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and try to teach people like how do you teach feel, right? It, it, it's that's a really tough thing to teach, but you know, I th I think you have so many recipes that will say like, oh, cook this for like nine minutes, and I can't tell you how many people would pull that. At nine minutes, whether it can still get up and run off the pan or is a lump of charcoal, like at no point during that nine minutes did you look at it and go, wow, that it's going a little strong there. Maybe, maybe I could pull that off now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I always try to like circle those things back to like understanding what, why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Like, like if you're, if you're getting a, if you're going for a sear, that's one thing. If you're going to, if you're going for a poach, that's another thing, you know, and really to kind of focus more on the method and what that means as opposed to the, the, the time. No, that's, that's a so. good point. And that's something too, that it, it's, again, sometimes that comes from your failures. I can't tell yeah. you, there's been a lot of times where, I mean, I remember the first few times I tried to fry a turkey and there's yeah. a lot of difference in a wild turkey and a store-bought. <laughs> and there's a difference in the time that you have to do that. And I was like, oh, the other ones I would do for this long. So I'm going to do the same thing. I pull this up and I'm like, it looks like a burnt tire and yeah. <laughs> probably hey. tasted like it. And I was like, I did it just to try it. I'm like, it, yeah, no one's getting this one. <laughs> it, it was like that turkey and Christmas vacation where they cut it open and just... <laughs> exactly and actually like with with game meats when when you overcook them that's where you get like that funky liver note you know it gets tough it gets sinewy it, uh, more so than domestic game yeah or more so than domestic proteins i should say mm -hmm. um yeah so a lot of I, again a lot of times when i hear people say oh i don't i don't like wild game and it's usually because you just had it prepared improperly. Um, you know, I'm big in like pointing out to people on the butchery side of things like that is a gland. Get that out of there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I've, I, I have, uh, heard 
I I have heard and from very reputable people that you know venison fat and glands and all that it doesn't matter if you cook it right i i can agree but i've personally never seen it myself you know yeah so so yeah the, your 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 care beforehand does so much to affect flavor well what are some maybe tips you have for people because this is you know a during the fall when I'm interviewing chefs, I like to have some tips and tricks, some 101, 202, whatever it may be to advance things. What are some things that you feel like maybe when you're teaching your courses that there's a, people are like those aha moments that people get that you're giving them stuff that it's like, oh, you know, you you really, if you do this, this, and this, you're going to have a, a better overall experience at the end. And whether that's maybe in the field or maybe that's in butchering, hey, pointing out the gland, or maybe it's in how you're packaging. And I'm also kind of curious too, like how you're packaging a lot of the different things. I've seen so many different methods. So maybe if there's some things there you can kind of dive into and kind of give me some of the things that you would tell people that were in your course. Yeah, so um, to people in my course, first and foremost, um, I would tell them for, for meat preservation, I'm keep on all the silver skin I'll, I'll take glands out but for the most part keep on the silver skin that's a barrier against frostbite basically mm -hmm. yeah that's the way i see it uh that and a good quality vacuum sealer um if there is air in the bag you are gonna get freezer burn um i have had some success though with some saran wrap and butcher paper but for the most part you're your average, your average hunter that's going to tackle this process at home. Um, a good vac sealer is worth your weight in gold. Uh, yeah. Recently, I've been doing some work with a with a company that does vac sealers and chamber vacs, and I'm a huge fan of the chamber vac now. Yeah? Uh, the, oh, my God. I chamber vac everything. I haven't jumped in there, but I've seen it, and it's very appealing. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's – with that said, the cost of equipment – um a suction vac a suction vac is cheaper than the chamber vac but the material for the suction vac is like 10 times the cost of the chamber vac bags right so if you use it a lot you very easily can recoup a difference in price but uh you know uh not turning this into a suction vac chamber vac commercial but right. <laughs> Right, right, right. But, no, but it's something yeah. that, that people need to know these things. So I've seen people that that you know they've wrapped it in foil. I've seen yeah. people who have have gone the whole saran wrap and then you know the butcher paper route. I've seen people who've just done butcher paper. I've seen people do you know chamber, you know, you know, back seal. There's been so many different ways that people have prepared it, or they're like, my uncle taught me to do this. That yeah. maybe isn't the best way to do it for no. long term storage, or maybe that might work for x many months as opposed to a year or two so i i think that's a and it's an important discussion yeah no the, the my my rule of thumb is the best way that you can afford to create a barrier between air and and the frost in your refrigerator in your freezer from the meat you're trying to save whether that is saran wrap and butcher paper or saran wrap and wax paper or whatever, mm -hmm. or a suction vac or a chamber vac, just be cognizant of whatever method you use, you draw the air. Oh, there's no air pockets or try to minimize the air pockets around your meat as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I know personally I pulled stuff out of the freezer and been like, Oh, wow. It's three and a half years old. Well, it's Wednesday. Let's go for it. You know, <laughs> and we'll do this on a Thursday, but Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wednesday is a, it's a busy week. It's a busy week in my house. So, but, but no, I mean, and, and, you know, depending on what it is, it, like ground, I've shaved off a little freezer burn and, sure. and, it's been fine, you know. Yeah. I mean, is it ideal? No, but is it? Uh, is there a hard? Oh, that's been in the freezer too long. No, it, it, it it's your comfort level. If you pull it out and it shriveled up and has freezer burn and and 
well, then yeah, toss that. But if there's just yeah. a little around the edges, you're fine. Yeah, you'll kind of know. <laughs> yeah, you'll you'll know. I mean, you know, because I mean, really, what you're talking about is the texture of your end product more than like it going bad. Like it's mm-hmm. in the freezer; it's not going to go bad in terms of become poisonous or anything overnight. It's it's just going to have bad texture, and and if it's gone too far, the texture will be less ideal. I yeah, it depends say. on who you're serving it for, right? You're serving it for yeah. family or you're serving it for that that buddy who's been on the couch for too long. You're like, here, you need this. <laughs> yeah, hey, exactly. <laughs> but um, but no, I mean, it, it, as long as your freezer stays frozen and you keep air away from your proteins, they'll ride. They'll ride a while. Yep. They'll, yeah, a lot ride. longer than some people think. I mean, yeah. I've, I've even heard Renella talk about that. He's like, I'm not going to give the exact many years that it was in there, but is more than recommended to you know <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> like i'm not advocating it as a new method yes however <laughs> yeah, the... if it fell to the very back of the freezer you can pull it back out <laughs> it was under that pile of frost back there yeah <laughs> it was encapsulated it was fine it was fine it was fine um do you do any dry aging um i do not i would truthfully i would love to Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of having the space to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, if I, I will let stuff hang uh, as long as I can, mm-hmm. you know, provided I have a place to, a, a place to safely put it. But, right. you know, I, I've looked into the dry age freezing you because actually i would love to do cured sausages Um, yeah 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 because basically it's the same equipment sure and (laughs) weirdly enough a little little mini fridge dry ager is about three grand so (laughs) i'm like ah not that not that excited about yeah yeah. (laughs) not yet does it make it that much better (laughs) talk about expensive meat yeah (laughs) if anybody listening makes a dry aging meat fridge please reach out here's our phone numbers call us yeah yeah <laughs> they, they, you got a new you got a new sponsor in about a month right there you go <laughs> yeah uh, if i'm lucky <laughs> <laughs> but but no I, I mean seriously though that i i would i would love to have a place to be able to do that yeah and 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 um dive it again dive in a little more into like your cured sausages like your salamis your traditional spanish chorizos and that sort of stuff yeah no that's it i got a buddy who does dry age my buddy matthew mitchell and he'll yeah. he'll do it in some an, out, an outdoor fridge and he's gone about a month or two we've done some uh some steaks that he's pulled out and i mean it's just amazing and we got a buddy uh larry white um wild game gourmet who's out yeah. and on yeah. the key and he's he was kind of walked us through some stuff last year on what to do and we tried him out so I'm always down to try, you know, some different dishes and different preparations and everything. And just kind of, you know, as far as sharing that too with the listeners. So, you know, speaking about wild game and, and learning from different people and, you know, talking to different chefs and getting some ideas, you know, this is part self-serving, but I think it'll it'll benefit every listener as well. Uh, you know, Matthew Mitchell and I have a list of different types of wild game in our freezer. And, you know, I would like to ask you some of the things that maybe you would do with that. Um, you know, maybe I'll just start with some of our small game stuff. You know, we've got cottontail. Uh, we've, every year we get at least yeah. a hand, handful of, of rabbits. And, and I just want to know, you know, what would you do with something like that? So funny you mentioned cottontail. One of the life-changing food experiences I had was a cottontail. So, oh, right. uh, yeah. So Let's hear it. While I, was in, while I was in the Navy, my ship ported in the, in the south of France. And uh, my buddy and I signed up for this whole, like, adopt a sailor thing where, like, local people would, like, take you in for, take you in for a couple of days. And um, we got adopted by this couple that lived in, they lived within the kingdom of Monaco. Okay. And so they they connected with us, told us to, we were porting in uh, Marseille and they told us to take the train to Monaco. So we, they pick us up and it was this wonderful older couple that ironically enough, they, 
lived in the Houston area post World War II, had a French restaurant in Houston that was around for years. And when they retired, moved back to because they were Monaco citizens, they're entitled to basically live there for free, I think is kind of how it works. So after they retired, they went back to they went back to Monaco to ride out the rest of their life. Well, this wonderful couple picked us up, made us this, this phenomenal meal with langoustine and shrimp and all these all these proteins. I've never I'm 22. I've never had this stuff in my life, right? It was <laughs> delicious. Well, the next day they want to take us up to their house in the in the Alps above Monaco. So we go up and they have this just gorgeous little hobbit house on the side of a mountain and they had all these rabbits running around the yard and the uh, older gentleman his name was louie goes and grabs this little 22 and he like shoots like three of the rabbits and brings them inside and what they made was the most divine thing i've ever had in my life it was they cleaned these rabbits and just with a little simple flour and butter pan fried them they made a pan sauce with some lemon and caper and then um and then serve that over just like a simple green salad on a plate and to this day i don't know if i've ever had better food in my life (laughs) wow yeah what a treat yeah no it, it was i mean and honestly for me that was i think that was when i first got the food bug yeah as far as like really thinking of food more the, as something more than just a commodity item. Right. Right. Like that, like for me, that was that first meal that I was like, Oh, this, this is something special. Yeah. You know? This is an experience, not just something. But, to but yeah. Fuel so, you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, with that said, if, <laughs> if you have some white wine and butter and a simple pan sauce and some capers, let me make an excellent cottontail with that. Nice, man. Yeah. We'll try that out. Um, moving on to some other ones, too. I guess uh, if you wouldn't mind, it, it maybe uh, let's jump into quail. We've got a bunch of whole quail that we have yeah. that are still left over, and we're about to be going again. It's A lot of these, we have some left over from last year. We've tried a couple different things, but we'd love to hear it because we're also going to be going and, and putting more in the freezer here soon. Yeah, yeah. So uh, – I. For for me personally, I love the traditional quail, just a little salt and pepper, hot hot oven and 10 to 12 minutes. Like to me, that's the best eating in the world. Mm-hmm. But I mean, you you can kind of elevate that by um by um spatchcocking them. Yep. Um smoking them for about 30 minutes until they hit like that medium that you like, and then uh from that give them a quick um Flash in, flash in a pan with uh, hot butter just to kind of see, just to kind of crisp up the skin. Yep. And then you kind of get the best of uh, both worlds with a fried and smoked quail, you know. Getting hungry over here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> definitely, definitely do that. Serve that maybe with a little fig jam and uh, whole grain mustard. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I bet, bet that'd be delicious. Oh, I'm in. And, uh, is that something are you do you do a lot of smoking? I mean, I was gonna ask you too, like as far as with your wild game things, are is there a certain stuff that you put on a smoker or is it is that something you don't, you know, maybe utilize as often? No, I I do I do a lot with the smoker. I actually really enjoy working with a traditional stick burner. Yep. Um, you know, I think your I think pellet grills are great. I think pellet grills help people make make a lot of uh, really good smoked food, but there's something about the artisanal effect of understanding the fire. Yeah. Yeah. For me, at least. Sure. No, I grew up with, you know, it was, it was mesquite and just because that's what we always had and yeah. <laughs> thousands of acres around us, but that was what, I, and then, then when I, we got, you know, I started hunting a little bit more in central Texas, moving into live Oak. And really kind of learning that. So I've got a big old smoker uh, that, you know, company I work with, um, Horizon Smokers had sent it down to me. And so I'm really learning that. It's been too hot in Texas because I feel like 
you know, I want to be comfortable when I'm cooking at least, you know, it's been yeah. like 110 degrees in the shade. I'm like, I don't want to sit next to a smoker right now. Like it's yeah. the last thing I want to do at the end of the day. But, you know, now as the temperatures will hopefully be, you know, decreasing, that's something I'm going to be using a lot more. I love learning and having something about live smoke and putting the wood on yourself. And so like, again, like, again, it's, it's for those who use pellet and that's, that's great. I pre- prefer to use, you know, that, that live wood method myself. You know, sometimes depending on what I'm cooking and how long I've been doing it, I question like, why haven't I got a pellet smoker? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, somewhere around hour 18 of every 30 minutes, throwing a log. <laughs> you know, I'm so tired. Yeah. Wait, you mean you could Bluetooth this in? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. We got a buddy. But, he's, he's like out at his house. He's like, or he's at the beach and he's got a, a beach house and he's like telling me he's like. Yep, just turned it up to whatever. And I'm like, from the beach? It's like, okay, this is this is going, this is maybe something that I might need to check out for just like those times you were saying, hour 18. Like, yeah. What am I doing? Yeah. So oddly enough, we we're actually in in my uh man cave smoke hangout room. Uh-huh. I uh this this project originally started out, I needed a shed and I wanted to have like a little lean to, to put my smoker under. So in the winter, you know, I wasn't fighting snow and wind and cold temperatures. And then I ended up with this and and my smoker's still outside. (laughs) So, you know, but, uh, it's all good, but, but now I have a bunch but now I have a cool place with cable TV and then, and it's climate controlled for uh, smoking on uh, football Saturday. So it makes those 18 hours, not as difficult then, you know, exactly. you have a place to come into for that. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> of, a, of a kitchen to mess up outside. Yep. That my wife isn't complaining that I'm messing up the kitchen inside. Yes. So. Yes. This is important, man. This yeah. is important as we grow and we're able to do those things. It's very important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but um, yeah, with the, uh, the game meets though, I, I, I find sometimes with the, with the fat content of game meat, mm-hmm. I will um, start with some smoke and then end in more of a slow braise kind of, kind of wet, kind of wet method Yeah, to, to, keep it from drying out so much you yep. know yep um whether you're smoking a brisket or cooking venison shanks it's it's that sweet spot of 180 degrees to 200 degrees that all of those connective tissues start to render out and that's when you get that fall off the bone uh tenderness of of those tougher cuts is in that window and the longer you can hold it in that window you know the more the more tender and the more of those connective tissues are are going to render out and up and start adding flavor and collagen to like your different pan sauces and that sort of stuff sure so so yeah, so I like to start a lot of that stuff on the smoker and the as kind of like a pre-cooked flavoring method. Yeah. And then yeah. and then finish it off and uh something that's a little more composed that can hold up to the amount of time that you have to cook it to achieve that result. Yeah, no, great points, man. Great points. Um I get I let me let me throw maybe two more at you and then and then uh you know I'll, I'll kind of let you go on that one. But um I, I know that we talked before and that you enjoy a good pate. Is there anything besides pate that you're doing with venison liver? Um, you know, I'll cut it into some grind. I'll, I'll, I'll t- I typically save it for when I'm making like boudin. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, I, I love, I love adding liver to love adding liver to boudin. Um, you know, I, but like the country pate, a composed pate, head cheese. Yep. All of, all of those are very similar <laughs> with with the cooking methods, the, a lot of a lot of the seasonings and uh, that sort of stuff. So, I mean, as far as like just making a big old pan of some venison, liver, and onions, oh, I can't do it. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm not a fan with it either myself. No, I love it. <laughs> I love the flavor notes it imparts, but as far as just pulling on up and taking a big old bite and I can't, I, I can't do it. It's fair, man. I'm in the same boat, man. I'm in the yeah. same, like even with pate, there's a certain amount. There's only so many crackers I can have of it, but you yeah. know, the boudin is something I hadn't really, I hadn't integrated that as, uh, and that's something that I really want to get into a little bit more this year is kind of doing that. Cause it's just something I, I didn't grow up having that. So it's something yeah. that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. So, I mean, if you, I guess, and it's simple, it, it, maybe it comes from previously working in the engineering field, but I, I process I break down everything in a process, right? So in my mind, head cheese, pate, country pate, and boudin start off here. And then at one point, one goes this way. Then at one point, one goes that way. Right, <laughs> right. Know? Like like they all kind of come, like there's an element of them that all kind of follow that same origin until, yeah. you know, it's it's pulled off in a different direction by the addition of this ingredient or that ingredient, but you know, you're, you're still working with the same parts. Yep. 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 You know, so like when it comes to boudin, like if you look up a Cajun head cheese recipe and a Cajun boudin recipe, they're virtually identical when, and kind of with your addition of the liver and how you poach out the hog head and how, you the the ingredients you use and then at some point you take what you allow to chill and become a block of head cheese and then you incorporate rice into it and stuff it into and stuff it into a, a natural hog casing and it's boudin yep. you know <laughs> so so um yeah so i i love i love experimenting with stuff like that and mm-hmm. kind of breaking that stuff and again, just kind of breaking that stuff down. Um, and I, I I also like kind of thinking of things I knew and grew up with. Right. And how do you, like, how do you, how do you make, say for instance, um, so living out in Colorado, right? We, green chilies are huge here, right? Like, yeah, it's fire roasted chili season right now. Yes. Big time. You know, like New Mexico is known for their red chili, Colorado for their green. There's some parts in Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado that get into full blown fist fights about who have the best chili. <laughs> so, um, so a few years ago I was like, how do I take, I had a bunch of wild, I had a bunch of wild hog and I was like, you always have pork and green chili. So I'm like, how do I make like a sausage with wild hog? Well, it's got all the flavors of green chili. So I started experimenting with that and then threw in a little pepper jack cheese and out comes this uh, fire roasted wild hog green chili sausage. And it works well with venison. It, I mean, it, how could it not work well? Yeah. Oh, with just a, it, it, just shy of a flip flop. I'm, I mean, you can kind of make anything with that flavor profile taste pretty good, you know. So, so my mind definitely kind of works a lot in the in, in that space of I like this, but I need this. So, how can I yeah, utilize bring it yeah. use these? How can how can I bend how can I bend this to make it work with this sort of thing, right? And and. I think that's also kind of what lends, I think that mentality lends a lot to working with wild game, right? Like, like you aren't working with your fat ratios of domestic proteins. So how, so yeah, you got to think outside the box a little bit, maybe go a little atypical to get wild game to work as you would a true 80, 20 ground beef. Right. Right. No, I so, mean, I, a lot of times the venison will add some like brisket fat or something yeah. that, you know, just including something else, it might bring a little bit of a different flavor profile. It's like I've had some people who are like, yeah, I use a little bit of duck fat or just something that, you know, bear grease, different things that yeah. you may utilize to just try to see what kind of flavor profile that can bring and bring in those other elements. You said the different types of cheeses or different types of peppers. 
And it's really just a fun, you know, experimental board to work with until you find out what, you know, flavor profiles you like or that, you know, those you're cooking for like. It's just, I, I, I'm, this is the time of year that we're always just trying different things and new recipes. Yeah. So much fun. Yeah. And, and, but with that said, not all ideas are good ideas. There's yes. some ideas that are just hot garbage from the start. <laughs> you know, yep. <laughs> probably an avenue you shouldn't. You shouldn't go down. <laughs> there's there's definitely some some filtering you can do as you grow your your stuff. Like oh, that recipe, yeah, I'm just going to skip that page altogether. I'm going to go to the next page. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the most part, like I, I, yeah, I experiment with two knowns, mm -hmm. but but yeah, there's there are just certain things like licorice and lamb, right? Like you've never heard of anything with licorice and lamb. You know why? Because it doesn't work. Maybe some green jelly. Go with what's known, right? Yeah, yeah. Like go for it. You can experiment, but the mint jelly. That's what I meant to say. The mint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah. Definitely. Feel free to feel free to experiment, but yes. you know, under... asterisks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I have, I got one more uh, that that Matthew had sent me over earlier today. He's got some wild hog bottom around, and he <laughs> wanted to know what you would do with that if you had some of that at your disposal. Oh, geez, bottle hog bottom round. Um, I would definitely go in and probably do like uh, a little uh, brie with it. You know, like braise that down in uh, red chilies, and then and then um, make and then shred that up. Make make tacos with a little pico, and have myself a nice little dipping jus with it. You nice. know, um, the, you know. Uh, actually, right now the uh, the uh, birria is is something I've been experimenting with quite a bit. Like I've I've done it a few times just with whole venison shoulder, mm -hmm. just just basically lop the hoof, <laughs> lop it off the knuckle, the knuckle just above the hoof, put the whole thing in a hotel pan and just let it go, and it, it comes out phenomenal. Wow, you know. Um, and then, and then also, you know, from a teaching standpoint, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a fun cooking method to include people up, bring them to the flat top and actually have them cook off their own tortillas and get that experience of working with that piece of equipment. You know, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. And it's a great, great group meal for that, for sure. But, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah. Have you, have you done any full hog? roast before i mean or, or you know cooking where it's like you got throwing on a table and everyone's just kind of picking off their own um i did one like before before i actually knew what i was doing <laughs> um there there was a there was a restaurant in my hometown that uh would do like a wild hog cook off and uh and my buddies and I became friends with the owner. And if we helped him with his whole hog day, we didn't have a bar tab for the day kind of deal. Nice. So, nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So we went out. Which, and we which helped that him. could actually hurt the end product potentially. <laughs> it, it, well, exactly. I mean, give, <laughs> yeah, don't give two like 24 year old guys an unlimited bar tab. You Come know, on in but, at nine, boys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's 6 a.m. type yeah. deal. You know, yeah. It it it, it didn't bode well. <laughs> but but no, that actually that's been my only whole hog experience. But from that, I mean I did learn a lot as far as uh the prep of the hog beforehand, because mm -hmm. obviously we had not started the open tab before with the prep. And I think that was the real work of it. So, so I did learn how to like go in and, and like cut the ribs and inject and, and different injection blends and that sort of stuff. So it, it was pretty cool. It's something I've always been intrigued by. Um, I, the times I've had it, like you go out to South Carolina oh, yeah. and you get it with like the crispy skin, but it's so tender and juicy in the middle and the vinegar sauce. I'm like, I got to do that. Yeah. But um but yeah, it's a it's a it's a whole thing, right? Like like you're investing in, into a vessel that is good for cooking a hog and that's about it. 
Yep. <laughs> you know. So, yep. So with that said, I haven't personally done done one to that capacity, but I I have taken some some little guys uh-huh. out in Texas, and you know, um, it started out with, oh yeah, this guy will fit on my smoker, and then. By the time it was all said and done, I think I ended up parting it out and grinding. And yeah, 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 you know. But 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 the plan was always there, and I know one day I'm going to bring that to fruition. <laughs> nice. Well, you have to call me when you do. I've got yeah. a, uh, I got the, my big my smoker now that I have. I've got the this whole last season where there's hogs on camera all the time, and I couldn't wait to go and get one. And then, of course, whenever it came to them stepping out, it was always a 190 or 200 pound hog. And I'm like, I cannot fit that. And I could probably, you know, I can get a shoulder or a leg on there, but I really have been waiting for that, you know, 50 pounder that I can be able to to do that. So my goal this year, it's one of those is I want to get the whole thing on the smoker and do it that way. And, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how, how that works out, but that's, that's <laughs> one of the goals there. <laughs> yeah. The, actually the first hog hunt I did, um, I was, I was out near, near Abilene. Mm-hmm. And we walked up on this tank and there were like all these hogs and I'm like, oh man, look at them. And I, I just opened up and boy, the ground shrinkage I had when I walked up on them. They were, were about that big. I, I could have sworn they were just massive hogs. They could have eaten you alive. Their tusks yeah. were this long. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the teeth, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And yeah, they were like this. I'm like, hmm, boy. <laughs> All right. That's not what I had planned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look so cool now. <laughs> hey, but it'll fit on the smoker. So there you yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and actually, um, with that one, I think we ended up cooking most of those at the ranch, just quartering them up. Yeah. Almost, almost like cooking chicken quarters. You know, yeah. we just season them up and just had them on the grill like that. Came out really good. Yeah, that's I, I I've done a few like that that um for the first time I ever cooked for for my now wife I think we were dating at the time, and uh in our I, I I forgot exactly even how I did it but I did it on the grill and I just remember I think I finished it in some kind of sauce but it was like it was the best thing it was the best pulled pork I've ever made which you know there maybe even asterisks there I've had some yeah. good ones I've made but I I was like wow and of course there's no time or rhyme or reason of like exactly what I did but. It's something I've been working on recreating. And so I got a couple, got a couple shoulders, got a couple of legs and things. I'm going to try in this year, but I'm, I'm definitely always down to, you know, learn. So I might be hitting you up on some ideas for some recipes. Um, oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. I, I will, I will definitely, uh, you know, op- I'm always open to good suggestions and trying different things out. So, um, you know, before we leave, I did have, you know, two last questions. Um, one is about your legacy. I want to know, you know, in your professional and your personal, uh, you know, life, what is it that you look at as your legacy and what you want to be remembered uh, as and for your contributions and and just kind of maybe, you know, if you want to dive into those together or, you know, a separate, however it is you see that, but, you know, talk to me about your legacy. You know, um, wow, that's a big question. It is. <laughs> Save it for the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you know, um, I ultimately, you know, I just would like to be known as an advocate that made the outdoors approachable. You know, uh, someone that was someone that was willing to share my knowledge with anyone who who asked. You know, um, I, I, I there's definitely definitely truth in the statement knowledge is power and you know as i think of how much my access to the outdoors has changed just by the shifting of of those that are entering hunting behind me i mean it's yeah so 10 years from now who's going to pick up this torch right yeah 20 years from now you know so so yeah i i i hope to uh hope to leave hope to leave behind 
uh, a bank of knowledge that uh, and share and share enough a bank of knowledge that makes people curious to explore it for themselves. Yeah. Huh. Um. But yeah, wow, man, how do you answer that question and not sound arrogant? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a tough one, man. I, you know, I I haven't been asked that one myself yet on any podcast, and I I have I, I haven't even put the thought into. So it's a tough one. You know, it's um, it, it, I think that. You know, I've I've heard a variety of answers because I've I've thought that that's a, a, an interesting question just to get people's mindset. But like, yeah. I think like you're talking about like being able to you know, uh, you know, be able to help facilitate that next person or that next generation or whatever it is that you're learning and make things a little bit better. Or, you know, make things accessible. Obviously, you're teaching and you're leaving so much. You know, I think in you look at like your courses, right? Someone comes in there. <laughs> you have then taught them, you've empowered them with some bit of knowledge, which they can springboard and learn more of. But until you've maybe opened that door, they didn't even know there was a door to open or, yeah. they, you know, you didn't, you, you're just showing them a few colors. Like someone was talking about the other day, like the idea of like the crayon box. It's like, you might've, they might've thought they had eight crayon colors to work with. And all of a sudden you've opened it up and you got that 164 and like, Whoa. And it's like, yeah, yeah. You guys don't even know there's a 256 box yet, but like, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you, Whatever it is, like you have this, you're opening up a, a love that will then it could be exponential. They could be showing their friends and their family and teaching them all the things they've learned from you. So you might not even ever know that extent of what you've done and how you've helped empower and change and enrich and have maybe introduce people to the the, the outdoors some wildlife standpoint. You might be helping to inspire future photographers or videographers in the outdoors or conservationists. You just don't even know what you've done, but by you doing and by you sharing, you're helping create that potential legacy that could be, yeah. you know, exponential. So yeah, it, yeah, it, exactly. You don't know really. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can only hope that you've, you know, inspired and yeah, I think you've done a lot of that. So I think that oh, there's, thank you. that's a wonderful thing. I mean, I, I know I'm excited for people to learn more about what you're doing, get involved in your courses, um, you know, follow you. And I, I guess that, you know, let's go ahead and tell people where can they follow you? How can someone sign up for, for one of your courses, one of your classes, if that's something they want to do? Um, you know, where are you posting about, you know, how can, how can those folks come and, and, and be a part of this journey? So um, for right now, the best way to follow me is either on Instagram at tagged out kitchen or uh, on my webpage at tagged out kitchen.com. Um, as I have events open up that are that are available for sign up and not so much of the um, private corporate stuff. But as I have events that I'm booking that I'm opening up for sign up, they'll definitely be posted about either on Instagram or on my personal web page. So cool, man. Anything I'm doing is going up there and uh, we'll also have a little more uh, comprehensive photo spread of the Buffalo processing. Awesome. Does that interest you? Yes. So, Should so interest everybody. Yes. Yeah. So that's a that's a story in the that's a, that's a story that's currently in the works right now. So great. By time by time this plays, it'll probably be old news. But <laughs> that, that's something you everyone will have to go and revisit. Even so, I the, when you sent me the picture of that thing hanging and you're next to it and you're not a small man, you know, and like it's not this. It's like. One of my friends is like, ah, it's a, is that is that a photographic, you know, kind of trick? And I'm like, I do not believe so. I was like, look at that again. That is a massive animal. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. And, yeah, and and the, actually, the head's like down in, like yeah. it's so big. I'm like, oh, the, yeah, the head's right there too. <laughs> yes, I was showing I was showing my little one that last night too, and she's like, wow, <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm like, yes, yes, yeah, no, what uh, a challenge. <laughs> yeah, definitely what a challenge. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I have got some reports back that the inside tenders were a little tough. <laughs> I can imagine. It was a yeah. very, very old animal. But, you yeah. know, it, it's what do you come to expect, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, but, uh, Lance, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Um, I, I love watching your journey and just kind of, you know, I cannot wait to get uh, to one of the the events. I know I couldn't make it the last time there through um, my buddy, you know, our mutual friend, Michael Sava told me all the yep. wonderful things and, and kind of sent me pictures throughout it. So I was extremely jealous and it just made me look forward to the next time. So looking forward to, to you know, having that experience to you. Everyone go visit Tagged Out Kitchen, 
follow Lance and Lance once again. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you, George. My pleasure. All right. You take care, man. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.